All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Side Talk podcast. Um, tonight, I have Chris Shaver. Chris is the couple's whisperer. He is a certified Berkman consultant, and he is on a mission to save 100 marriages. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you for being here. It's very nice to be here. Thank you, Keisha. Thanks for the nice intro. No problem. So tell me, tell us, I always talk us, right? So tell us, what is a certified Berkman consultant? Well, the, the Berkman method was based on um, empirical research. It was done in the late 40s. And it was research that really that answered the question, how does our behavior change in our close personal relationships? Why do we go from our usual everyday self into our stressed out behavior. And it's really stunning research that was done um, on top of which they created a, a, um, an assessment, which is itself a piece of genius. But it really does answer the question, um, why couples fall out? What it, it's, I always say that uh, disagreements don't end relationships, behaviors do, and what they found were 22, 22 pairs of opposite behaviors that if you get it wrong, if, if you offer me it this way and I need it that way, there will be conflict. And so I'm certified in reading the Berkman uh, assessment reports and telling couples um, where they're going to have problems. And it's not going to be, it's not, it's not if, it's when. <laughs> I've never, I, I, you know, I, I'm a 60 something guy who's been in business a long time and I, and I took a lot of personality assessments through one thing and another. And every time I took a personality assessment, I thought, ah, you know, they got me. It was like a horoscope, you know, some of it sounded good, some of it not so good. When I, when I saw my Berkman, I, I changed my career that day. I said, I have to, I have to do this because this is profound information. It was so profoundly accurate that. I thought I'm going to bring this to the world, and I know that there's another 60 some million marriages right now that are uh, half of them will fail, and there's another 25 million couples who cohabitate. Half of those at least will fail. So people need this information. Yeah, it sounds like it. You um, offered me an assessment, and I didn't take it. So make sure you send me that assessment. <laughs> I wanted to take it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's really the most interesting conversations happen when you do take it. Yeah, because it's all behavioral. It's not um, people know like Myers Briggs and you hear types and you're like, oh, I'm this type of an INFJ or an XYZ or whatever. And it's very nonspecific to the point where Myers Briggs isn't really statistically reliable. The conversations when you have a Berkman are like, oh my goodness, I've these are thoughts that I've been thinking about other people that I've never told me before. Um, so it's, it really becomes a very interesting conversation where you're talking about the real you. Mm -hmm. And most of us are sort of like in our heads, you know, responding to the world, but um, thankfully not telling everybody all of our thoughts all the time. Right. But Berkman tells you your filters for why you're judging people the way you're judging in relationships and work relationships and close relationships. Oh, oh yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to give it to you. That, that's going to be so interesting for me. So tell us, what interests you about helping married couples? Well, my own, I, I was married happily for 27 years uh, and had a wonderful ma marriage. Um, my wife went through uh, a physical and a mental health crisis mm -hmm. and came out of it with fundamentally a different personality that varied uh, seasonally. And we went from getting along to not getting along. And our, we went from never fighting or our fights would be very peaceful fallouts to having kind of screaming, yelling matches all the time. She wouldn't go to a marriage counselor. And so I'm the guy who read 100, 150 books on marriage counseling to try and figure out what was wrong. And I can tell you right now that uh, I couldn't find what was wrong, what was going on in my marriage in any of those books. And really it wasn't until I took a Berkman and I, it was just one of those, oh my gosh, look at that. It, it was right in front of me all the time. 
I didn't know what I didn't know how to look at it. I didn't know what I was looking at or what to call it. I didn't have the language to articulate it. So when I found that, it was like I can tell you that the books aren't going to tell you the answers. But I can tell you that there is a simple way, and and I'm making it simpler on my website, Good Couples Whisperer, um, making it so that for 150 bucks you can take the assessment both of you as a couple or individually and see that right there in black and white within 24 hours the biggest mistakes you could ever make with each other let's make them every day okay oh so, yeah go ahead no i'm sorry if you weren't finished you can finish your thought i'm sorry no i have nothing but th i have nothing but thoughts go ahead <laughs> 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 okay so basically you got interested in saving couples because you were married for a number of years and then there was a change in your marriage due to um, an issue that your wife had and then things went a little left so you ended up getting divorced right we did yeah and it was really sad for me but um because by the time i found berkman there was so much water under the bridge I mean, honestly, if you have one screaming fight, that's maybe one screaming fight too many for a lot of people. And really, when I was a kid, I was 11 years old. My parents did have that one screaming fight about credit card bills that they had both racked up. And that screaming fight fundamentally changed their marriage. They never got divorced, but their marriage was never the same after that. And they stayed together for another 65 years. Um, but I can tell you that the love was gone out of that relationship almost within six months of that fight, wow. their behavior towards each other just fundamentally changed. And so couples can, without really knowing it, step over lines that they shouldn't step over with each other. And I think there's a lot of things Berkman can tell you, but that's the biggest, first, best thing it should be. These are lines you don't step over with your spouse or your partner. Wow, that's so interesting. So, um while you're helping and, and counseling couples tell us what's the worst situation you've ever seen and then what's the best well the worst situation i ever saw was actually the very first couple i ever worked with and it was a marriage counselor and his wife he was a phd psychologist he taught marriage counseling at a mid-major southern university and they came to me recommended by a business client um, kind of presented as tire kickers, like, oh, they'll be interested in this. But when they showed up, uh, it was a phone consultation way before coronavirus or anything. We were just, you know, they lived in somewhere down south. And when I got them on the phone, they were two extremely tense human beings. Um, and I'd done, I've done conflict remediation in work settings using Berkman. And I knew conflict, uh, people in conflict when, when they got on the phone with me because, you know, just tense and barely could get a word out of them. And they'd been married 30 years. They'd been in marriage counseling for 20 of those years. And they'd been fighting like cats and dogs their entire marriage. Mm. So, and it turned out that the husband had actually changed his career to become a marriage counselor. He was in psychology, but he changed the focus of his career to see if he could, he could, you know, figure out why that they would just, you know, at the snap of the fingers, go into these cats and dogs, burn down the marriage kind of fights. Well, in about 15 minutes, I saw the hidden, um, I say there's 22 pairs of opposite behaviors. And so sometimes your behavior, just let's talk about opposites for a sec. Sometimes your behavior is, I'm behaving this way, but I need this way. I need the other side yeah, of the opposite pair. And that's what it was. They both were very assertive. And so they would go at each other. Mm. The, the wife needed her husband to be very easygoing and not assertive. Now here's the really complex, strange part was when he didn't be easygoing with her, when he was like really trying to battle her over and assertiveness usually um, comes to the fore around decision making. You know, it's going to be my way, my way, the highway, my way. And you, know, you get louder and louder. And the more he louder he got, and the more he talked over her, he got triggered. 
Now, back to this whole thing with Berkman is the, the research was originally done to say, why do we go out of our usual behaviors into our stressed out versions of ourselves? And mm -hmm. I think if you've been in relationships, you may have noticed that when somebody trips your trigger, you're like, you know, you do something, you get louder, you get quieter, uh, you know, you get in their face, you disappear entirely, it's fight or flight freeze, um, freeze them out, cold shoulder. There's all kinds of these stress behaviors. Anyway, her stress behavior when he talked over her and got louder was to go from somebody who was fairly mild, but you know, somewhat assertive, but fairly mild person into a fighting tiger. And so that, and that really wasn't predicted because what Berkman actually found was that most of our stress behaviors are sort of kind of in line with what we need from our partner. So that need, which is to show up and be easygoing and let's not get, you know, our knickers in a knot over a decision. Let's talk about it calmly and low key. The stress behavior for that typically is uh, agree, but really inside you're still disagree. So you become kind of passive aggressive, but it's not to become like, you know, the tiger. Right. So when he would trip her trigger, she would go into tiger. He would respond with tiger. That was his stress behavior. And they were, and that those two those two stress behaviors are part of competition with winning. Mm. There was another behavior in there that that really ramped it up. Fights that are competition with winning never end. Nobody backs down. Nobody wants to lose. Yeah. And so those are what I call tear down the marriage, burn down the marriage fights. And they had thirty years of them. Mm. So I showed them the trigger. I showed them the behavior that don't talk over top of her you have to when she gets louder you get calmer and inside of 15 minutes and at the end of it i you know i they eventually told me that you know he was a marriage counselor and a phd psychologist and you know i was kind of nervous i'd never worked with um anybody any married couples at that point but i said what do you think and he's and the husband who was the phd said this was like 20 years of marriage counseling in a box except you actually showed us what we hadn't been able to find in 20 years of marriage counseling so worst case you really couldn't find a worst case couples who were just you know at each other at each other's throats for 30 years that's i mean it says something about what good people they were to hang in there with each other but that's a rough case yeah um easier ones are just where you show up and you just it could be the same kind of situations but people don't really get ahead of steam and you just say when you you know you see when you're just like talking too loud i mean it, it become easy when you say instead of talking loud instead of getting louder just get quieter and it's like it's almost magical it really is almost magical when you can show a couple some sometimes it's young couples i work with um i've worked one on one for the past 10 years and when you can just say you know that thing where you get this scuffle over decision and the next thing you know she's you know throwing daggers at you with her eyes and uh you know resisting you at your every move every you know and you just say just do this instead of that and it's like magic but people are people aren't certainly that self-aware about behavior mm -hmm. and our needs what we need from our partners since we were raised by and large to keep our mouth shut and do what our parents or our grandparents or our teachers told us uh, people don't talk about their needs. And so there, we don't have this language and Berkman brings language to this. And once you have that language, if you have two loving people who are really trying, it, they're all easy. Um, they're, they're all easy. It just becomes, you know, being a little bit more sensitive to your behavior and what your partner needs. Yeah, I think self-control is so hard <laughs> to like, you know, really owning your behavior and really getting a hold of yourself and being able to do the things that you are saying that you know people need to do to make things work. I think that's the most challenging thing for people is to really take a step back and you know become self-aware and then be able to control themselves. So um, I think well, let me let me just respond to that because what Berkman gives you, mm -hmm. what these this biggest mistakes you can ever make with your spouse or partner gives you. It tells you what your triggers are. You don't have to, you don't have to be that uber or self-aware yourself. Mm -hmm. When when the marriage counselor said it's like 20 years of marriage counseling in a box, 
what he was really saying is it was in, it was instant. We instantly have this insight and this intelligence. And so I think the hardest part can be, you know, what behavior is it? Because you might only see it once every three months. It might only be when you're talking about the budget, right? And all, all of a sudden you're in a fight about the budget and you're like, how come every time we talk about the budget, we have the same fight? But, it, you know, we only talk about it every three months and then we refuse to talk about it for another three months because we know we're going to go there. So it's it's what what I've got is, I honest to goodness, I think it's like magic, is that you instantly get, uh, don't do that behavior around me. It's going to make me nuts. Could we try it this way instead of that way? I say it's you heed your need. You read you, you read that need, and it's like that behavior is going to make me crazy. And then what behavior would work instead? And then you feed the need the right way. But it becomes simple. Things that can be hard in relationships become simple when you have that level of self awareness that's been given to you. Yeah, absolutely. Self awareness is the foundation. Um, I did a summit on self awareness, so I'm definitely a huge. Um, advocate for people getting to know who they really are and you know figuring it out so in your opinion when is it a good time to seek marriage counseling well i'm not a marriage counselor so what i would say is uh what i do know about the statistics are that people don't go to a marriage counselor until it's too late so in other words what the research shows is that People wait six, six years after they know they have a problem to go seek help. And at that point, y'all probably hate each other. And it's too late at that point because, and then you're going to go and argue in front of somebody who's got to figure out these invisible things, which are these needs that Berkman points out. And frankly, I've read the literature of marriage counseling. They are not, there are 22 of these things. Marriage counselors are tuned into three of them. And the rest of them, it's a crapshoot whether you'll find somebody who's natively sensitive and intuitive enough to kind of get it. But really, once you're at that point, you know, if you waited six years, it's too late. My, I mean, maybe I'm out tilting at windmills, but I'm saying, hey, I can give you 22 years of marriage counseling in a box. Here it is, $179. Why don't you take this? Because half of you all are going to end up split up. Right, so why not take a shot at something that's real, that's based on an assessment? Don't go buying a book that's, you know, one size fits none. I've read 150 of those books. <laughs> I'm telling you that they all reflect the bias of the author. They all reflect the bias of the author, and the author's personality and the author's marriage is not your marriage. So yeah, to me, it's why not do something that's specific to your exact relationship that knowledge and then when you go to then take that to a marriage counselor if you're still struggling say here are our needs we're having trouble navigating them but go there with some self-knowledge and go there before you have the problem okay all right so i'm going to ask you to share a couple of tips and some insight on some different things that you've learned over the years so give us an example of a big mistake one can make with a spouse well, there's 22 of them, but let's just take one. That's, uh, I always say there's three fights in every marriage. So, and the first fight is a respect fight. And it can be quite invisible to couples. Um, the normal pattern that Bergman found, it, the behavior around one-to-one -one communication is how we feel, give respect, receive it, how we feel it. And that pair of opposite behaviors is, very direct on the one hand and indirect and tactful diplomatic on the other. So there's the, the direct folks are, and most of us are more direct than we need from our spouse or partner. That's the, that's the normal pattern. Most of us are more direct than we need. So if you had to guess, <laughs> I would say, don't be so direct. Don't be so task focused, recognize that your spouse could use, you know, um, hey, hon, if you get a minute, could you help me with this? Rather than saying, can you get over here right now? I need your help. Like you can hear the difference between those things because most of us do need more direct or less direct than we're given to each other. So that would be kind of 
generalized tip number one. Now, <laughs> what's what's very weird about the tip business when you're in the Birkin business is my last client, um, the wife was direct and she needed direct. The husband was direct, but he needed indirect. So the real tip is pay attention to the behavior. And if, if your partner gets PO'd when you're talking, understand that the opposites of too direct or, you know, to indirect, however, however it floats, that's really what you're going to fight about because somebody's going to take offense to the behavior, likely not the words. Um, tip, that's, it's hard I, being a Berkman, a Berkman consultant because I can't rattle off the tips because I, I have clients of every stripe. Right, and I understand that. So when you when I ask these questions, please understand that we understand that it's not one size fits all and it depends on you know who you are and how you receive and you know um, give information and things like that. So guys, we know that, right? So we take these tips with a grain of salt because we're all different, right? But I yep. can say to you, as a married person, right? I've been married for uh, 12 years. It'll, is it thir 13 years this year? And we've been together for about 20 years. And that, what you just said is spot on that whole respect thing. Cause me and my husband, we can get into little arguments about that, right? He, he might not like my tone or the way I say things cause I'm very direct and sometimes it's too much for him, you know? Yep. So that the fact that you just mentioned that, like, I know that cause I've lived that. So that is absolutely true. So share one tip on how to avoid fighting over money. Well, so when it comes to money, the behavior that attends that, the pair of opposite behaviors, I'm always going to talk about the pairs of opposite behaviors, but on the one side of the scale can be somebody who sees the world through the lens of team. And so we're talking about how we're going to spend, how money will be spent in our relationship. If we're in that kind of relationship where we're sharing, either sharing one bank account or two bank accounts where we're deciding who's going to contribute what either way. And so people who have that, um, they show up team focused and their need would be team focused. They'll see everything as all boats rising together and people with that perspective might um might be very idealistic about you know I'm, I'm willing to give up for the team why aren't you willing to give up for the team so the, the flip side of that scale is is kind of what's in it for me um and and i want it to be measurable what's in it for me and i'm not gonna you know so so an argument could be between those two personalities could be um I'm not I'm not going to give up for the team unless there's some clear measurable outcome that's going to benefit me and and the person on the lower end of that scale who's team focused would think well you're selfish you're not willing to contribute you're not willing to be part of this this is our family um, so that kind of an argument it can be an awareness for the person who's more actually there's some awareness on both sides because the awareness it's either going to be one or the other of those things. It could be two people who are both what's in it for me and they're arguing over who's going to get more than the other. You know, we both need something. I'm going to, you know, and then they hash it out, negotiate it out. Either way, however that fight's going to take place, what you have to recognize is that there's a third party at that table with you negotiating. And that third party is your relationship. And so however you define that relationship, what you do have to say is at the end of this negotiation, there are two things that have to happen. One, we have to mind our behaviors because like I said, disagreements don't end marriages or relationships, behaviors do. So being respectful, going back to what we were talking about, stay respectful. Number two is if let's say that you're, you want a measurable, sometimes that measurable is that you both have to reach that um, negotiated space where nobody wins, but the relationship does win. 
And that can be a difficult place to find, but if you're negotiating for the relationship to win, it's different. it becomes different than negotiating for me or for you. Uh, what's in it for me becomes, what's in it for me is we get to stay together. We get to stay married. Um, might not be the perfect solution. You know, the minivan might not be the, the Trans Am, but um, sometimes that's, well, got three kids and nobody wants to break their back getting in the back of a Trans Am to buckle the kid in the, into the car seat. But you know what I mean? So it's it's the relationship has to be in that conversation and you both have to uh, respectfully you know, bring up the relationship as part of the outcome. Okay. So another um, tip, how can couples renew their relationships on summer vacation? That one, I, I think summer vacation is a wonderful time actually to take the assessment and because number one, if you're on vacation, you're gonna have time to be together that hopefully, unless it's a vacation from hell, it's hopefully a, a nice, you know, a little bit more of a, an easygoing time. And so having, I don't know, we used to go to the beach. And so there were times when we, you know, the kids would be in the water or whatever, and we would have time to talk to each other calmly. So having real, uh facts at hand about who you all are and no pressure it be and and time which is important in a relationship time is it's i think it's a wonderful thing because strangely enough um i was talking to a divorce attorney not long ago who told me that his busiest time was september mm. and so it can be the it can be the flip side right you spend too much time with somebody that you know, then you start to, you know, you get into it because you don't know each other well. Instead of going there and assuming it's going to go well, arm yourself to have a real conversation about real things and real behaviors and do it in a way that you get a shared language um, and come out of that vacation stronger than ever. Don't come out of it, you know, thinking you can never do that again. Yeah. Do you ever get referrals from di divorce attorneys? It's an avenue I'm exploring, but but the sad part is, is once people are there, yeah, they are so entrenched in their attitudes and beliefs about each other. Mm -hmm. I can I have given people that far down the pipeline, uh, Berkman's before, but um, in in um, marriage counseling language, they call it attribution. Mm -hmm. You attribute the worst about your spouse or partner once you're at that point. Mm -hmm. Whether it's true or not, you attribute the worst. Yeah. And so once people become entrenched in their attributions, it really is too late. And I've worked with a couple couples um, that I can think of right off the top of my head where, boy, was it too late because it didn't matter what you said, they just were 100% sure that other person was evil at that point. <laughs> yeah, I, I could just imagine. I used to be a paralegal um, and there was a divorce attorney who had space in the office that I worked in. And the stuff I used to hear was insane. Like, yeah. I really couldn't believe it. <clears throat> well, and it, it really does become competition with winning. When you bring a lawyer into it, 99 times out of 100, the lawyer is a competitive animal. So now you're in a, if you weren't truly in a competition with winning fight, once you bring the lawyers into the room, you are absolutely there. And it's all about winning at any cost. I mean, you listen to Johnny Depp and what's yeah. her name, Deborah, Deborah Heard. I'm that so over it, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that whole trial though, it's just one upsmanship. Yeah. One, and, you, and one argument is crazier and more over top than the next. You have no idea who to believe, but Honestly, that's what it looks like when you get to the end. So if you think waiting six years is going to help you solve it, good luck, because maybe you're throwing vodka, vodka bottles at each other at that point and <laughs> lopping off fingertips or <laughs> yeah. whatever happened in that crazy marriage. That's wild. So this is a great segue into one warning sign your marriage is on the rocks. One warning sign that your marriage is on the rocks. I think the biggest, uh, 
the biggest warning sign that your marriage is on the rocks is that you're not seeing the best of your spouse or your partner. Mm -hmm. In other words, if stress behaviors, if the best is, you know what you look like when you're interacting in a positive way, if stress behaviors are loose in your relationship, you'll see that different side of your spouse or partner. And if you're not seeing the best, it's, there's a pretty good chance you're actually seeing a stress behavior. And some of them are fairly subtle if you're not that quick to pick up on them. But you really should say, am I seeing you know, normal or am I seeing something that it's not adding up? Because people, uh, there's a healthy number of those stress behaviors that lead people to just disappear. You know, that whole ghosting, ghosting can happen inside of a relationship. It doesn't have to be a dating term. So I would just say the, the biggest warning sign is there's a stress behavior going on and there's stress between you interpersonally and it's not going away. Yeah. Um, and it's not a nothing. It really is a something, Keisha. Yeah, absolutely. And the last one is give us one reason why the silent treatment kills relationships. I think a lot of people resort to this behavior. Yeah, so the silent treatment, uh, there's two ways that it typically will come about, but if we go back to the one-to-one -one communication, um, the predicted stress behavior, when you need someone to be more tactful, more diplomatic, less direct with you, the predicted stress behavior is retreat, retreat into silence. And so, and that uh, that person who's got that inner sensitivity um, is basically asking you to come at them, but come at them more softly. And by, it's often interpreted as leave me alone, and if you come at them and you're too direct, you'll get more of the same and they'll really tell you to leave, them, leave you alone. But it's a stress behavior. It doesn't look like a fight, doesn't look like a screaming fight. But what's going on inside of the head of that person who's giving you the stress, that silent stress behavior treatment uh, is the relationships dissolving inside of their head. Mm, that's scary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. And it's, I mean, I think it's pretty true. So why 100 relationships? Why are you wanting to save or help? Actually, <laughs> actually that's a typo. I would say 100 million. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's 100 million because there's, I don't know, 62.5 married uh, million married couples and another 25 million who are cohabitating and you could easily imagine with those numbers with the adult population in the US being over 350 million, there's close to 100 million people who are in relationships. Before you got married, you probably went through, you know, if you're like the average adult, maybe six relationships before you found the one. Um, we're all have this, we all have the same problem. We all have needs to be treated in certain ways that we are unable to articulate. And it's the reason why the batting average I mean, if half of all marriages end in divorce, that's, those are really bad odds, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and the really bad odds are, um, you know, people always say like, well, why, why don't we learn this thing when we were little? And it really is very tricky because, you know, you have a three-year-old who's running in traffic. You don't stop to ask him what his or her need is for crossing the street. You just grab him by the collar and you pull him back and you say, don't you ever do that again? You know, and it could be, well, you know, it could be anything going through their head, but then they're five and you're still maybe doing the same thing and maybe they're 13 and you're still treating them the same way. And the net of it is we're taught to behave in ways that meet our caregivers' needs. And we're never, unless you have a enlightened parent, you're never really taught to uh, enunciate your own needs. Mm -hmm. Now you find yourself in a relationship with somebody who's supposed to love you, who's supposed to know you and get you, and they're not getting you. And you're like, you, know, you don't have the language. It's even more interesting than that because I worked with couples 
who use the same exact words to mean opposite things. Ooh. It's it is absolutely out of crazy land when you see that. And it's the other benefit of Berkman is it gives very these opposites are very distinct and clear. And you get very you, you use this word for this side, use that word for this side, don't mix them up. <laughs> right. It's like having language that you can both agree on can sometimes be the entire ball game. It's like, oh, I, you know, I had a guy who was saying, I, I'm all about the team, but, you know, it, he was negotiating for himself. And he said, oh, in sports, whenever, whenever I played sports, by giving my best and scoring the most points, I figured I was helping my team. So I figured I'm a really good, you know, I'm a team focused person. And they're like, no, you're kind of a self, you know, you, you're all about yourself, and which isn't bad if you recognize it, but the word can't be used that way, right? Yeah. It, it's like, what's in it for me is not the same as what's in it for the team, right? So language, language, language can rip up and tear apart more marriages than you could imagine. For sure. So um, I want you to share an oh hell yes moment, which um, an oh hell yes moment is a moment of clarity or a moment where you felt successful in your life. So share one of those moments with us. I, I You sort of broke up on that. Uh, what, what kind of a moment? Oh, did you? Okay. So I said, share an oh hell yes moment with us and an oh hell yes moment is a moment of clarity or a moment where you feel successful in your life. So share a moment with us where you thought to yourself, oh, hell yes, this is great. You know, I finally figured out blah, 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 or oh, hell yes, I feel like I'm on the right path or I'm doing something, anything that resonates with you along those lines. Yeah, I told you, I told you that my wife and I ended up going from 27 years of peaceful relating to becoming the fighting couple. Mm -hmm. And my oh hell yes moment was in the kitchen. Uh, we had a fight that I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, a yelling, screaming fight that broke out in about 15 seconds. And I was visited by what I would call a moment of grace. So maybe it's an oh heaven yes moment, not an oh hell yes moment, but everything slowed down and i saw it was be, it was tone of voice it was uh looks it was her body language and i realized that my triggers were all about those subtle behavioral things and within three months of that moment well first of all in that moment i stopped fighting and and i primarily stopped all those screaming fights because now i could see what i couldn't see before but it opened the door to me to the fact that behavior was what was setting me off it wasn't anything said or done it was just looks and it was body language and we all speak to each other 85 percent of communication is uh nonverbal mm -hmm. and so and nonverbal communication is potent potent behavioral communication within three months i was a berkman consultant because now i knew what to look for I didn't have any idea what I was looking for before that moment. And when I found it, I was like, oh, hell yes. This is exactly what I was looking for. Wow, that is great. Oh, that reminds me of my husband when you say that you, you know, the body language and stuff like that's a trigger for you. Because he's always like, why are you looking like that? Why are you looking like that? You know, but You're I'm very expressive. Like I have an expressive face. I make like a lot of eye movements. They don't always mean anything, but you know. <laughs> well, we're, we are all open books. Yeah. If you know what you're looking at and what you're reading and he knows what you look like when you're happy and okay. And he also look, knows what it looks like when you're, you know, mm -hmm. got something going on. Yeah, he knows me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. You're right, Chris. Well, it's, <laughs> That's a good thing, right? He's paying attention. Yeah, he does. He's very perceptive and he knows. He feeds off my energy so he knows when something's not right. So Yep. And energy. Very it can be very subtle, but it's just like, yeah, I'm I'm living with Laura now and uh we were shopping for flowers at a local uh market and there was a guy there who was way too direct. Mm -hmm. And I went away to do something and she went took stuff in and she came out looking like she'd been traumatized. I was like, 
what happened? She said, nothing. I said, no, not nothing. Something happened. And the guy had just been like way too direct, said, come on over here. It's like, you know, she was just like, right. what did I do? <laughs> you know, it was just, just got dramatized, but it was just a look in her face. That's all it took. It was like something happened. What happened? We oh. do it all the time. I know it definitely happens. I'm glad you shared that because my my last question was going to be how's the dating going, but I'm glad that you're living with Laura. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah, we're well. we're um, going on year number two. That's He's nice. been living with living with me since uh, October, so and it's good. It's, it's an interesting thing to have a relationship that's based on this awareness. Most of our conversations. Um, somewhere become involved around the behavior that we're offering and what we need from each other. And it keeps the lines very clear. I love it. And do you mind sharing where you met Laura? And the only reason I ask is because this is for all my single folks. I like to give them hope that, you know, you can still find love out there. Was it online? Was it a friend of a friend or was it a random meeting? No, it was online. And it was interesting for me because um, I forget whether it was uh, uh, one of the dating sites, but everybody's got their own personal taste about that. But uh, it wasn't until I took a really hard look at my own Berkman assessment and my needs, and I wrote a very clear uh, self-description about what I needed from my partner in a relationship, and that attracted her specifically. So that clear awareness of self in the language of Berkman's kind of modified a little bit, but mainly that um, Berkman measures those it measures interests. So, you know, I have a high literary interest, love to read, high artistic interest, all those things I expressed clearly from that. And that became the foundation for us starting to talk and then, you know, getting together. Love that. Thank you for sharing that, Chris. So please tell everyone where they can find you so that they can, you know, connect with you and figure out how to sign up with you and, and take this assessment. Sure. Um, I'm on coupleswhisper.com. And actually, uh, for your audience, I've got a free um, report, How to Survive the 22 Pairs of Opposite Behaviors. So if you'll go to, to coupleswhisper.com and sign up for that, I'll share that with you and then give you an opportunity if you'd like to also purchase. Um, once you kind of get your arms around it and learn a little bit more, maybe you'd like to purchase the um, how to avoid the biggest mistakes you can make with each other report, which is based on your assessment. But it's at coupleswhisperer.com. Amazing. Thank you so much, Chris. I really enjoyed having you on the podcast tonight. Keisha, it was my distinct pleasure. Thank you so much.